Let's, uh, while, uh, let's start in Mark chapter 4 to begin with. And, um, you know, tonight we're going to talk about fruit. And we're going to talk about um, we're, we're going to talk about the mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit. You know, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, but in Mark four, um, he Jesus was addressing them, and he he's in verse twenty six. He says. The kingdom of God is like a man who scatters seed upon the ground and then continues sleeping and rising night and day while the seed sprouts and grows and increases. He knows not how. Well, that's kind of like us. You know, he plants his seed in us and we live night and day, you know, and Years go by and you're like, wow, I'm not the person I used to be, <laughs> right? Well, the seed is producing fruit, right? And it says, and the earth by itself, first the blade and then the ear, then the full grown blade in the ear. But when the grain is ripe and permits, isn't that interesting? Grain is ripe and permits, immediately he sends forth the reapers and puts in the sickle because the harvest stands ready. Well, we talk a lot about first fruits here, but it's not just first fruits. It's, there's, a, there's a harvest coming, you know. You know, he says that over there in Isaiah 26, he says, you know, only when my judgments are in the earth will the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. You know, and, and in Isaiah 6, he, he, he says, you know, uh, he, he, Isaiah says, uh, he says, who shall I send? And Isaiah says, well, send me. And he says, well, go and tell this people here and here continually, but don't understand, right? And he said, well, how long, Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant, right? And the Lord moves his people far away. Well, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but people don't really start listening and hearing. The, the, the big body of people of the world, they don't hear until the judgments are in the earth. Um, you know, he, 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 sent, um, he sent Ezekiel uh, to Israel. Ray and I were talking about this afternoon. And, I, and we talked about it a couple weeks ago in Ezekiel chapter 1, I think it is. And, and he said, hey, I'm not sending you a people to a foreign language, right? I'm sending you to the house of Israel. He says, you know, these people are uh, impudent. They're hard of hearing. Well, you know, the body of Christ tends to be that way. Uh, they're hard of hearing. Um, you know, Jesus always, hey, to any man who has ears to hear, it was funny, we, we were on the way in, we stopped and had something to eat, and, and the, the waiter that came to our table, and he was a young kid, you know, and he got our drinks wrong first thing, you know, which is no big deal, but he was real apologetic, he says, this is my first week, I just got out of training, and we were like, don't, don't worry, she's still a big tipper, I'm telling you, but... Um, and we were kind of chuckling, and she goes, he doesn't listen very well, does he? And I said, no, he needs to get married, and then he'll learn how to, he'll learn to hear good. Or he'll learn how to shut his ears. Right. <laughs> right, there you go. He said, or he'll learn how to shut his ears. Our ears there are tightly closed. No, but anyway, um, <laughs> but, but the truth of the matter is, <laughs> Uh, if you want to increase your hearing, um, uh, get your ears circumcised. Uh, get your heart circumcised and, and go and hear a lot of word. You know, uh, all the word we've heard over the years. I mean, there were times where we were having five services a week. And they were great. You know, the, the word came forth. It was anointed. And, and you know, you just... 
you were in such a, had such a uh, habit and a practice of listening to the Word and listening to the Holy Spirit, right? And, you know, that'll give you ears to hear. I mean, there is hope for anyone that uh, doesn't seem to have ears to hear. But the problem is that when you're in religion, in the Christian religion, uh, we tend to have a lot of preconceived ideas. And, um, you know, Jesus said that. I looked it up right before I came, and I think it's in... Uh, where was that? You know where it says, for the sake of your traditions. Well, one is uh, Matthew 15. That okay, that's it. We'll go to Matt. Hold your finger there. We'll go to Matthew 15. I'm sure glad I have Ray here beside me. I know Owen was because I used to go sometimes to the Wednesday morning services and Ray would be over there with the concordance on his lap, you know, he, half asleep because Ray's always been a night owl, you know, and, and, and Owen would go, Ray, where is that? And, and Owen's, I mean, Ray's like, shh, 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 turning the pages, you know, getting the chord chord, or he'd just go, oh, that's that, so, you know. <laughs> I mean, Ray, uh, Owen could really count on Ray, you know. Ray, where was that scripture? Well, that's what I'm doing to him now. So, flashback, Ray. Matthew uh, 15, I think it's in verse 6. Yeah, well, let's see. Yeah, he says, uh, for the sake of your tradition, right, the rules handed down to your forefathers. Well, let me say, Traditions can come in all kinds of ways. Um, yeah, there can be a lot of church traditions, or how about traditions in the American lifestyle, right? We pick on that all the time. We just hammer this thing home about American exceptionalism or the American lifestyle and all these things. Well, uh, you know, these are traditions, and, and he's saying for the sake of your traditions, you have set aside the word of God, uh, depriving it of his force and making it of no effect. That, that's the thing, Make it, making it of no effect. Um, this is a serious thing. It is a serious problem in the body of Christ. And, you know, he, here he sent Ezekiel, you know, to, to Israel and... Um, <laughs> You know, and, and he was saying, hey, these people are impudent, you know, and he had to send his big hitter over there to get their attention. And I think eventually they martyred him. Um, you know, he just told them what they didn't want to hear. You know, and there was that other place where there was that one prophet, Micaiah, I think that's his name. 400 prophets are saying, you know, go up and do your war. And Micaiah's going, no, nah, I wouldn't do that. God's saying, don't do that, right? But that's not what they wanted to hear. But you know what? That guy was right. But that doesn't mean uh, if just one guy's saying it, he's right. But often, most of the time, if the majority are saying it, it's probably not right. Mm -hmm. And these are traditions. There's so many traditions in the body of Christ and in America today. And um, what, 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 this is really important. What I'm saying here is that if you're looking at it through that lens, you're going to get it wrong. And you could get yourself killed. You, you could find yourself like in Revelation chapter 6 after the green horse and you have that group of people saying, uh, how long, Lord, before you avenge our blood? Right? Well, they just went through the green horse. So sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beast killed all these people in the body of Christ. But that wasn't God's will. He didn't want them to be killed. Right? He would rather them overcome it. But... Um, they're, they're probably looking, of course it's a future event, through a smoky lens. And, and in America, uh, especially because America won World War II, America was a great Christian nation, all right? 
And so now, because we had that generation of victors in World War II, and, and it was obviously that you know, Germany was being led by a, 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 a madman, an occultist, and a madman, and, and, and uh, you know, Stalin wasn't much better. And who knows, uh, you know, how, how uh, evil the uh, emperors of Japan and all that stuff were. I mean, it was all idolatry, right? And um, it, there was, a, there was a, it, it was a, a easy to see good and evil, right? But now, just, you know, 70 years later, now America's evil. It's an evil nation. It is. It's idolatrous. It, it, it's like Babylon. It's, you know how Jeremiah said, uh, they're mad about idols. There's idols everywhere. <laughs> American Idol, there you go. And, and now, well, we don't put idols up. Actually, we do. They're everywhere. Uh, yeah, sports, entertainment of all kinds. I mean, you name it. There, it's idolatry. I mean, you can go over the bridge on chapter uh, the on uh, Interstate 30 up there by the stadium, and you'll see uh, obelisk all over the place. Well, why, why, why are there obelisk on the bridge there? Well, because that was all uh, built uh, because of the AT and T stadium over there. And guess who funded AT and T? Well, yeah, the city of Arlington with their taxes, they got built out of, but it's Freemasonry behind all that stuff, right? It's Masons, right? So there's their idols. But I'm, I'm getting off track here, kind of. Um, so he was sent to these people that, Israel, that was hard of hearing. Well, that's who we're sent to. Uh, you need to start seeing your, look, I have a problem. I don't see myself as a musician. He's a musician. I don't see myself as one. But he says I am, and he's a musician. So I'm having to go to the Lord and go, what about this, God? You know, I don't, I'm not a musician. Well, we're kind of like that in the body of Christ where, well, I'm not a preacher. Well, I'm not a teacher. Well, actually, you are. You are. To whom much is given, much is required. Uh, you're going to find out in a very short future that you are a teacher, actually a beacon to the body of Christ. They're going to come to you. I'm telling you, they're going to come to you and they're going to want to know what is going on because it's fixing to come unraveled. It is. They, the elite of the world, uh, they didn't perpetrate this big con game on us last year for nothing. They're not going to stop. And it says they went on conquering to conquer the, the rider of the white horse, well, there's more coming. There's more plague coming. There's more war coming. There's more economic uh, um, breakdown coming. And people are get, the nation is going to become unraveled. And the cities will begin, begin to be, uh, there will be, begin, begin to be social unrest. And people are going to come to you and they're going to want to know what's happening because they're going to be scared out of their wits what is going to happen to us but in the same way that that i don't see myself as a musician y'all don't see yourself as teachers but you are you are uh, what is in you is in you and when they come and like sponges they'll draw it out of you they will it'll come out of you it's in there Right? And see, in, in America, in, in, bear with me here. Uh, don't, don't shoot me down. <laughs> Please. <laughs> don't shoot me down. Uh, and, and, and look, I'm not saying I have it all figured out and I'm walking it perfectly, but it needs to be said. In, in the church, in the body of Christ in America, we have a, a thing that's Christian nationalism. Don't embrace that. It, it is an illusion. It's not real. It's, it's, it's deception and actually it's manipulation. The, the elite 
are manipulating the body of Christ into this whole thing of, um, you know, America is great and it's going to be great again and, and God is for us and, and that we should, we should uh, you know, fight these wars because, you know, we're preserving uh, uh, freedom in the world. Well, that's not true. It's, it's a lie. What you're doing is you're supporting the military industrial complex, which is trillion dollar business. And it's what's driving the economy in America, that and big oil. And they have to keep that going or it all goes under. And see, the problem is, is that the elite of the world uh, are behind all of it. And, and the goal of it, the end game of it, is globalism. And you know who's going to be the leader of the global government, don't you? Yeah, the Antichrist, right? We're in the last days. And the body of Christ, the huge majority of the body of Christ doesn't even want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about the book of Revelation. They don't want to talk about end time prophecy. Uh, a, a lot of denominations, uh, they don't want to talk about the, the rapture or anything like that. They don't, they don't talk about it. It's their official stance. And here we are in the end times. You see how the same way Ezekiel was sent to these people and they're hard of hearing. They, they just, no. Nope. Well, um, we don't talk about that. Well, we don't believe that. We don't believe that. And yet, all the signs are right there in front of them. Okay. Uh, kind of rattled on there. Sorry. Go back to Mark chapter 4. So, you know, Mark 4, 29, but when the grain is ripe and permits, immediately he sends forth the reapers and puts in the sickle because the harvest stands ready. And we know that there's a first fruits harvest and then there's the big harvest at the end. The first fruits is in, in the middle of the seven year a covenant. Uh, hold your finger there and go to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14, 14. He says, Again I looked, and behold, I saw a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud, one resembling a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head, and a sharp scythe or sickle in his hand. All right, well, that's Jesus, right? Remember how Jesus went up in the cloud there in Acts chapter 1? He said, This same Jesus whom you see go shall show... So come in like manner. And another angel came out of the temple sanctuary, calling with a mighty voice to him who was sitting upon the cloud, put forth your scythe and reap, for the hour has arrived to gather the harvest, for the earth's crop is fully ripened. So he, was, so he who was sitting upon the cloud swung his scythe on the earth, and the earth's crop was harvested. And then another came, angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he also carried a sharp scythe. And another angel came forth from the altar, who, was a, who had authority and power over fire. And he called with a loud cry to him who had the sharp scythe, put forth your scythe and reap the vintage, the fruit of the vine of the earth. For the grapes are entirely ripe. So the angel swung his scythe on the earth and stripped the grapes and gathered the vintage from the vines of the earth and cast it into the huge winepress of God's indignation and wrath. And the grapes and the winepress were trodden outside the city 
and blood poured from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia or 200 miles. Well, that would be, uh, if you want to pan up there, Ellen, that would be at the seventh trumpet, or after the seventh trumpet, actually, probably more close to the seventh bowl. Um, and, um, you know, that's talking about the Battle of Armageddon, uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39, and that kind of thing. At, at the seventh bowl, right? Six. The seventh well, it begins after the seventh trumpet be, because he said there in uh, verse nineteen uh, to cast them into the huge, huge wine press, press of God's indignation and wrath. Well, right there in uh, chapter fifteen, verse one, he says, "Then I saw another wonder in heaven. There were seven angels bringing seven plagues." For with them, God's wrath is completely expressed. Well, that's the wine press. Okay? All right, so that's where that is. Right, and he goes on to, in chapter 15 and into chapter 16, describe the seven bowls of God's wrath and indignation. All right, so look, uh, God is going to harvest his crop. That The first he puts in, he, he harvests the, the earth's crop. Well, that would be uh, his people. People who, uh, uh, his people, okay? And then this second one, well, that's everybody else that are not his people. And they're, they are cast into the huge wine press of God's indignation and wrath. And you know, this, this is the deal. Uh, in, in verse uh, chapter 7, he talks about a vast host whom no one could count from every tribe and language and nation and people. And he says, well, who are these? And he says, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. That's this. They've come out of the great tribulation when God is harvesting his crop. And... and uh, it's his crop, you know, because they were seen in heaven, you know, in, a, in the sanctuary, and they shall hunger no more or thirst no more. So what does that tell you? It tells you that a vast host whom no one could count were of the body of Christ in the wrath of God. Right? You see what I'm saying about a heart of hearing? You know, Jesus talked to the church of the seven churches in, in, uh, in Asia there in, in Revelation 2 and 3, and, and he said to everyone, he who has an ear to hear, let him be listening, right? But, it, it, okay, if you allow yourself to be uh, uh, deceived by what you hear, um, outside of God's word, then um, you, you might find yourself there. And you think you're right. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, go to, um, back to Mark. Verse 30. Yeah, chapter 4, sorry. Mark 4, verse 30. And Jesus said, With what can we par compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use to illustrate and explain it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds upon the earth. Yet, yet after it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all the garden herbs and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air are able to make nests and dwell in its shade. With many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them. They were able, uh, as they were able to hear and comprehend and understand. Now, that's important. As you're able to hear and understand, 
the Holy Spirit, Jesus did because he was there, but now we have the Holy Spirit. As you're able to understand, he will teach you what you need to know. But you have to have ears to hear. And if you're rejecting for, for whatever reason, whether you just don't want to hear it or uh, you think it's wrong, or you, you, you get mixed up in, in Christian nationalism, I'm telling you, you're being manipulated and deceived. Who's pushing that? Who's pushing it? Uh, the government, the State Department, uh, the media, which is all bought and paid for. Yeah, I understand that, but who is it? I mean, the elite. Yeah, I know, but the global elite. The I understand that, the but church, uh, who, can you give past, me a person? Pastor Jeffers in Dallas. Okay. Uh, Kenneth Copeland. Uh, not my person. It's a big movement. It's a movement. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a movement. People in it have names. Greg Locke. Uh, you name it. Uh, in the body of Christ, all the big people are pushing it. The, the, the prosperity, the 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 the, the, the uh, what is it? Dominionism bunch, the Seven Mountains bunch, uh, you name it. They're all pushing it. Evangelical Christians. Yeah, yeah. And see, uh, in America, look, we all came out of. Uh, Post World War II, you know, we were the kids of kids or grandkids of people who went to World War II, so we saw it back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. We've seen the the massive decline in America. Yeah, we've seen the massive buildup of wealth and technology, but we've seen the great falling away of Christianity in America. I mean, this used to be a pretty decent nation. And now it's filthy. It really is. You know, when before COVID, 17% of the people went to church regularly. What do you think it is now? You know, and, and every program on every movie that's ever made, practically, uh, you know, the, 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 the priest or the preacher or the clergyman, they're, they're weirdos, right? Well, that isn't by mistake. But anyway, um, but he, 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 as, as, uh, as they were able to hear, uh, he would teach them, okay? And see, there was a, there was a time when, well, we'll get to it. I'll, I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, go to uh, verse 1, Mark 4, 1. Jesus began to teach beside the lake and a very great crowd gathered about him so that he got into a ship in order to sit on the sea and the whole crowd was at the lakeside on the shore in verse 1 and he taught them many things and parables in comparisons put beside the truth to explain them and in his teaching he said to them give attention to this Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he was sowing, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. And other seed fell on the ground full of rocks, where it had not much soil. And at once it sprang up, because it had no depth of soil. When the sun came up, it was scorched, because it had taken root, not taken root. It withered away. Other seed fell among thorn plants and thistles and grew and pressed together and utterly choked and suffocated it. It yielded no grain. And other seed fell on good soil, brought forth grain, growing up increasing, yielding 30 and 60 and 100 times. And he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him be hearing. Right? And as soon as he was alone, those around him uh, they began to ask him, and you know, he's, and he tells them, to you has been entrusted the mystery of the kingdom of God. I would say that to you here today. To you has been entrusted the mystery of the kingdom of God. Listen, there are hundreds of millions of people out there that don't have what you have. They don't. They don't have it. They don't know it. Even in the body of Christ, 
They don't know it. And it's been entrusted to you, which was hidden from the ungodly. For those outside, everything becomes a parable. And he says, in order that they may look and look and see and perceive and may not hear and may hear and hear and not grasp and comprehend, lest haply they should turn again and it should be forgiven them. What forgiven them? Not hearing, making their ears tightly closed, right? Not understanding with their heart. See, he says they ought to repent of that, lest they turn happily. Happy would like that, wouldn't he? Happily. You know, when you turn, you get happy again. Before you turn, you ain't happy. That's just the way it is. And he said to them, do, do you not discern and understand the parable? How then it is, is it possible for you to discern and understand all parables? The sower sows the word. The one along the path are those who hear the word, so, who have the word sown in their hearts. But when they hear, Satan comes at once and by force takes away the message which was sown in them. The same way the ones sown upon the stony ground are those when they hear the word at once perceive and welcome it with joy. And they have no real root in themselves, so they endure for a little while. Then when trouble or persecution arises, it didn't say if persecution arises, it says when it arises, because it does. It comes uh, on account of the word. They immediately are offended and they become displeased and indignant and resentful and they stumble and they fall away. And the ones sown among the thorns are those others who hear the word. Then the cares and the anxieties of the world, the distractions of the age, the pleasure and delight and false glamour and deceitfulness of riches and the craving and passionate desire for other things creep in, choke and suffocate the word, and it becomes fruitless. See, that's what we're talking about here tonight is harvesting the fruit in, in you, right? And see, he, he, the distractions of the age... Well, can, I, can you say politics? It's a distraction, right? I mean, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people? Come on, give me a break. That, that, that is no more, sorry. It, it, it's, it's, it's a government by the corporations, for the co corporations, right? Right, and the corporations are all owned by the elite. I mean, can't, can't you see that? It's okay for Amazon and Walmart to stay open last year, but mom and pop couldn't because they were essential, but mom and pop weren't, right? That should tell you everything, right? It's a, it's a, it's a redistribution of wealth. And this is what it happened in Venezuela and, and, and uh, the Weimar Republic in Germany and Zimbabwe and they just print, 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 and they're handing out all this money, and guess what? Every time they print a dollar, it dilutes the stack until eventually it's hyperinflation. They all got rich, and everybody else gets poor, and that's how the thing goes round and round, right? And this is the world we live in, and I'm just saying this, this American exceptionalism, this, this uh, Christian nationalism is an illusion. And the body of Christ that is listening to that and embracing that are going to be like the, those in the fifth seal in Revelation chapter 6. That's where you're going to find yourself. Because, why? Because God wants you to overcome that. He wants you to overcome that deception, that manipulation. And how? With the truth. The truth is in God's Word. The truth is there if you have ears to hear. But if, you're, if your eyes are tightly closed and your ears are tightly closed, 
And you, no, no, I, I want to believe that. Well, that feels nice to believe. Well, why, did, why is that? Because it's comforting. We want to believe that, that uh, the American government, you know, Uncle Sam, that he's going to take care of us. Well, that's not going to happen. They're taking care of us all right. Right? Right? You know, when, when they force you to inject something into your body that you don't want to do, when they force it, when nothing is really there, wait till they force it when something really is there. See, that's what's coming. The, the thing that just happened was a... Uh, um, it was a beta test. That's what it was. And it's getting the whole population used to what's coming. The next pandemic's going to be a real one. We may see millions of people die, hundreds of millions of people die from the next pandemic. They're getting you ready so that everybody will stand up for their vaccination. Right? So, and the church by and large is supporting this. They're supporting it, right? Because, you know, evil China and evil Russia and evil uh, such and such, the Middle Easterners, right? Right, when they don't even look in their own backyard and see the evil that's being done to them. And they refuse to see it. And this is a very cloudy lens that Christianity is looking through and it's going to get them killed if they don't watch out. I'm, I'm, t I'm just telling you, you need to start testing what I'm saying here. Just give it, okay, just give it a test. It, it, if it doesn't pass the litmus test with you, you can go back to the way you thought. But unfortunately, the sad truth of it is, is America was taken over from the inside. It was. It has been taken over. It isn't going to be. It already has happened. They're giving you the illusion that it hasn't happened. It, it, Nazi Germany was a, a great example of this, right? They, 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 they thought they were living in the golden age, man. And, and they were buying cheap stocks and everybody was playing the stock market. You know, all this money was given out in America and lots of Americans took those stimulus checks. They went and bought stocks with it. Well, you know what? The stock market is a, it is a massively inflated bubble and it is going to burst. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is, it's an illusion. Okay. Right? And it really, this, this one sown among the thorns is, is one in America that is just, it has just infected the church. It is full of thorns. Sorry to say. Go to John 15. I know, this is a... It, it, it's a hard pill to swallow. It's, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say things, John 15, and say things like this because it's so negative. And that's why the body of Christ, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this. Well, see, the thing of it is, is God has a solution. He has got a solution. He has got a way of escape that seems impossible. But it's not impossible. It, it's not with him. It's not. And it, see, it's his escape plan. It's not ours. We don't know what to do. Exactly. Right? Do, do you all have to figure out you know what to do? No. There's nobody I know that's going, I understand what's happening. I got it all figured out. Mm -hmm. Nobody I know. Nobody I've listened to. Right? But God has a way. And that's why the overcomers there, the first fruits, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. You know, that's a good thing. If we have to feel after him, that's a good thing, right? He doesn't just 
reveal everything to us and, and set the whole plan out ahead of us and go, well, there it is, just go on in it. No, he wants us to feel after him the whole way through so we don't get lost in there. You know, if he told us exactly when it was going to be and how it was going to be, we would wait until the last week to get ready. That's how we are as dumb human beings, right? Oh, I'll just wait to the last day and cram for the test. Ay, ay, ay. But see, God's got a program, and his program includes, hey, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as is the habit of some people, 83% of the population before COVID, and, uh, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, yeah. right? So that the measure of thought and study that you give to the truth that you hear, if you never hear it, see, that's the thing. I'm saying these things. I don't have it all figured out. But we have to say it so that we can get on the same narrative as God's on. So that when he adds to the revelation, it all makes sense. Right? You know, he was saying, as they could hear. Right? He would teach them more. But in John 15, verse 1, he says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts away and trims off. And he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more richer and more excellent fruit. See, when we hear the word, he's pruning us. See, he's not cutting the branch off. He's pruning us. It's a real skill among people who do those kinds of things. And it makes the tree much more lush and it makes more branches and better fruit, right? Well, that's your life, right? He's pruning you all the time, right? You are cleansed and pruned already because of the word which I've given you. Dwell in me and I'll dwell in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. You know, even Jesus said, I'm able to do nothing of myself, but only as I hear from the Father, right? Even Jesus said that. See, he was the example of how that works. I am the vine, you're the branches. Whoever lives in me and I in him bears much fruit. However, apart from me, you can do nothing. If a person does not dwell in me, he's thrown out like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire and they're burned. Right? Oh, well, I'm going to hell. No, you're not going to hell. You're going through the fire. Right? It says that in 1 Corinthians. I'll, we'll go there in a minute. If a person does not dwell in me, he is thrown out like a branch and withers, such branches gathered and thrown into the fire, and they are burned. If you live in me and my words remain in you, continue to live in your hearts, ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. When you bear much fruit, my Father is honored and glorified, and you show yourselves and prove yourselves to be true followers of mine. Verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I have appointed you. I have planted you. All right? This is for you. This is personal for you. I have, you hadn't chose me. I chose you. I planted you that you might go and bear fruit and keep on bearing fruit. And that your fruit may be lasting, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You know, if you bear fruit, you're not going to be asking for the uh, things to, uh, to satisfy your flesh. Why? Because it's the fruit of the Spirit, right? The fruit of the Spirit doesn't 
cause you to degrade spiritually so that you act like that, the fruit of the Spirit, you would see what's really valuable. And you would ask for those things that really have, that last throughout eternity, right? Uh, go to Mark chapter 7. We'll start at verse 6. And Jesus said to them, Excellently and truly did Isaiah prophesy of you, the pretenders and hypocrites, as it stands written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts hold off and are dis far distant from me. In vain, fruitlessly, and without profit do they worship me, ordering and teaching as doctrines the commandments and precepts of men. You disregard and give up and ask uh, to depart from you the commandment of God clinging to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting and nullifying the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition, your own human regulations. This, this thing of Christian nationalism, um, go to Mark chapter 3. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem in the body of Christ. I, I mean, I, I'm hearing it all over the place. And see, you know, when Jesus, uh, in, in the book of Revelation, you know, we talk about this all the time in chapter 18 where he says, you know, come out of Babylon. Well, Babylon is confusion. And mixing uh, God's word with, um, with, with uh, the mind of the flesh, that's confusion. You know, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And you see, this is, this is what he's, he's talking about here, is that when you try to mix sense and reason, you know, at one time, they, they, said, they said of Jesus, he's demented, he's crazy. Why, why were they saying that? Because when the mind of the flesh hears the mind of the spirit, it sounds crazy to them. That ain't right. That can't be right. They were saying that to Jesus, right? In, in uh, Mark chapter 3, yeah, yeah, here it is. In Mark 3, uh, 20, Jesus went into a house, probably Peter's, but a throng came together again so that Jesus and his disciples could not even take food. And when those who belonged to him, his kinsmen, heard, they went out, to take him by force. And they kept saying, he's out of his mind. He's deranged. And the scribes who, came, who had come down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebub. I know it says Beelzebub, but I don't like to give him any glory, so we'll say his name funny. <laughs> you know, he probably thinks that's cool, you know, Beelzebub. Beelzebub. I know, I've seen occultists, you know, yeah, Beelzebub, you know, well, right. He's possessed by a Beelzebub and the, the prince of demons, he is casting out demons. And he summoned them to him and he said, he said to them in parables, how can Satan drive out Satan? And if a kingdom is divided and rebelling against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house divided is divided against itself, that house will not be able to last. 
And if Satan is raised in a res insurrection against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. All right. The kingdom of God is within you, correct? Isn't that what Jesus said? The kingdom of God is within you. Well, if you're mixing the word of God and the, re re uh, the revelation of God in your life, especially end time stuff, because that's where we are. We're in the end time, and we're given the end times as a warning and as a preparation so that we will not fall into the trap that Satan has set for the entire world. And you're mixing God's revelation with what's coming through the TV set, right? That is a kingdom divided against itself. All right? And if you mix that, that kingdom ain't going to stand. You're going to end up like the fifth seal. Lord, how long before you avenge our blood? Well, they're in heaven. I thought they were supposed to be plucking a harp and walking down golden streets and be happy all day. No, they're angry because they lost their lives by deception, you know? And that's the first thing Jesus warned about. Be careful that no one deceives you when the end time comes, right? And what we're trying to do is go, hey, think about it. Everything you hear through the media I don't care what channel it is. It doesn't matter what channel it is. You're hearing the mind of the flesh. That's what you're, you're not hearing the spirit of God. You're not hearing any revelation. You're hearing the mind of the flesh. And let me tell you, it's complicated. This isn't simple. You know, people think it's just black and white. It's not complicated. No, it's super complicated. The whole system of the world, you know, what a tangled web we weave, right? When we uh, endeavor, practice to deceive, right? It is super, super complicated. Very complicated. You're, you're having all these different factions of people and they're all vying for the piece of pie, right? And it's dog eat dog. Right, And they don't care who they burn as long as they get their piece of the pie. I mean, if you lived in, the, in your life in the, the day of an average Wall Streeter, you would be blown away by the filth. You would be blown away. They sold their souls. They sold their souls. I'm telling you, it is awful. Or the average uh, person in Washington. It's filthy. They, they would sell out their own grandmothers, a lot of these people. I'm just telling you, this is the world we live in. And this is what the media, who is bought by these people, the most elite of these people, it, the narrative that's being sold to the American people is a lie. It is deception. And it's going to get people killed. It's going to wipe them out. It's, it, they're going to come to the point where they're just, what happened? Well, you got deceived. That's what happened. You bought the narrative. See, God's got a narrative. He's feeding it to us. Little by little, day by day, year by year, He's got his narrative, his word, his way, his plan, right? Well, Satan, he's got his. He, it, what, what God does, Satan does. But he's, he's, Satan can't tell you the truth. When he speaks a lie, he speaks what's natural to him, right? And he's got all these elite in the world. I mean, we've read it, Psalm 73, Psalm 37, Psalm chapter 2. Right, Psalm chapter 1, I'm going to on and on. We've read all about the elite and what happens to the end. You know, you know, when I went into the sanctuary, I understood. Right before that, he was like, well, they get away with everything. Well, they get everything. Right? He puts the, the, the rich in slippery places. Right? That's just the way it works. See, 
If you read there in Romans chapter 1, you know, he says, hey, I, I tell every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth in their hearts, they know what's right and what's wrong. That's why his judgment comes. Because they know and they're still evil. Right? And eventually, the day comes and it's harvest time. So what are you going to do? Right? So, you know, he's saying, hey, if Satan drives out Satan, you know, if a kingdom's divided against himself, God's saving us here, right, in our hearts. He's planting his word and he's renewing our minds. But if you're mixing those seeds, if you're mixing those narratives, that's confusion. And you'll end up in Babylon. That's why the great falling away. That's why the one world religion is coming. That's why the false prophet is coming. That's how they get away with it. Right? And it's all deception. It's always deception. Right? Just saying. Let's go back to that 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Kind of tie this together and then we'll... 1 Corinthians 3. I mean, is this, is this clear to you what I'm saying here? Yeah. Yeah, see, God wants us to see things from His point of view. He wants us to understand what's really happening. Mm -hmm. The world's going to hell in a handbasket and he's not willing that any one of them should perish. Jesus died for every single one of them. He's, he doesn't want any of them to perish. But what does it say? Until cities lie waste without inhabitant. Because people, they don't want to hear it. And he gives them free will. Right? That's why Jesus said, if any man wills to come after me, let him deny himself. Let him, let him give up his own interest. Right? And we think, well, well, I could never have a life that way. Nothing will be fun anymore. If you give up your life in your own interest for Jesus, you will have the most fulfilling life exactly. that anyone could ever have. Amen. That's the truth. See, it's the, very, the mind of the flesh goes, no, no, that's not going to happen. You know, I'll never have any fun. I'll never have anything. That's baloney. You'll be fulfilled like you've never been fulfilled. Because we got to believe that God knows what life really is. Anyway, in um, well, let's just read this. In, in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, However, brethren, verse 1, I could not talk to you as to spiritual men, but to non-spiritual men. Uh, men of the flesh in whom the carnal nature predominates. See, this is what we're dealing in the body of Christ for the most part, unfortunately. Uh, as to mere infants in Christ, unable to talk yet, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not strong enough you, to be ready for it. But even yet, you're not strong enough to be ready for it. For you're still unspiritual, having the nature of the flesh under the control of ordinary impulses. For as long as there is envying and jealousy and wrangling and factions among you, are you not unspiritual and of the flesh? Wow. I mean, that really hits home, doesn't it? Behaving yourselves after a mere human standard like like mere unchanged men right i mean we have to take the test and we got to go hmm oh lord you know and the lord asked me something the other day he says what do you want i mean he said it to me like that he goes what do you want it upset me i was like why is he asking me that he must, he must not be too pleased with me. <laughs> it was the way he said it to me. I was like, uh, I don't know what I want. 
I've been meditating on it. Said, Lord, you know. <laughs> well, I did say that. Yeah. You know what I want. <laughs> ah, still, there's more to it than that. He's trying to yeah. get down to the nitty gritty with me. Yeah. Anyway, for when one says, I belong to Ray, or I belong to Owen, or I belong to Steve, right? Oh, man, I feel sorry for you. Are you not ordinary men? What is Apollos? What is Paul? Ministering servants, not heads of parties through whom you believed, even as the Lord Jesus appointed each his task. I planted, Apollos watered, but God all the while was making it grow and have the increase. So neither he who plants or is anything nor he who waters, but only God who makes it grow and become greater. He who plants and he who waters are equal, yet each shall receive his reward according to his own labor. For we are fellow workmen, uh, laborers together with and for God. You are God's garden and his vineyard and field under cultivation. Right? His building. God's building. According to the grace of God bestowed on me like a skillful architect and master builder, I laid the foundation and now another is building upon it. But let each be careful how he builds upon it. You know, I've said all along about the revelation of the timeline and the end times and stuff like that. The last thing I want to do is tell you error. I don't want to make mistakes. I don't want to get it wrong. So it's good that I have all of you to keep me in check. You know, sometimes God shows me something, or he has, and it was like, you know, I knew it was right because, you know, you know his voice and you check it with the word, but then you're like, Ain't nobody else saying that. You know, it's like, mm, I don't know about this. And we used to have some tough people in this place. Some really tough people. And they weren't going to let you get by with nothing. I mean, y'all probably wouldn't either. But they weren't nice about it. <laughs> you know, I mean, they'd let me have it right between the eyes if I was wrong. So I had to check it in every angle I could check it. And then I go to him and him and him and her and uh, what about this? And, you know, we'd have our arguments too. And then eventually we would get down to it. But see, we don't want to have error. You know, all those years, great anointed ministry with Owen, right? It was wonderful. And no doubt about it. You know, he was like Paul. You know, he was like a master builder, yeah. right? Okay, he made some mistakes here and there. Now that we, God gave us more revelation, you know, the things were unsealed, we got it right. Was he evil? No, he wasn't evil. He was doing the best he could, right? He didn't mean to lead anybody into error. He's doing the best he could, all right? So he's just saying, you know, be careful. Be that's, careful, that's what he was doing. right? He was being careful. And, and so when we said, well, that wasn't quite right, and we straightened it out, do we resent him forever? No! We're thankful forever for, for the foundation that he laid for us mm -hmm. to work with, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's no resentment at all. It, only gratitude, honestly, in my heart. There you go. We're standing on his shoulders. You know, we didn't make all this up. You know, we brought along as we were able to hear. And God gave the increase. He made it grow. Ab absolutely. Uh, so, no other foundation can anyone lay than what which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. But if anyone builds upon the foundation, whether it be with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw. See, these are parables. It's an example. You know, we went from a garden and now we're building a building. The work of each will become plainly known for the day of Christ will disclose and declare it because it will be revealed with fire. Right? Remember back over there in Revelation 14? 
the angel who had power over the fire, right? That was interesting to me. Let me want to look at that real quick. Yeah, had authority and power over the fire. See, he's putting in the scythe. Revelation 14. That was 14, 18. Okay. It, the, the day will be revealed with fire. See, we're coming up to that day. All right? I mean, look. America isn't going to be judged. America is being judged. We are under judgment right now. If you don't see the idol of the sports teams and what's happened to them, you're just not looking. That is being judged. It is a huge idol in America. The men of America who be, should be standing up and fighting Satan and contending for the word of God are spending their time instead watching sports. It is absolutely insanity. They should be using the Spirit of the Lord and their testosterone to fight the enemy for their country and their families. Mm -hmm. And they're in the idol of watching sports or playing sports or doing whatever. Right? Mm -hmm. And that is being judged. We are under judgment. And he's using men to do it. And they're evil all, as all get out. Be revealed with fire. The fire, fire will test and critically appraise the character and worth of the work of each person has done. If the work which any person built on the foundation survives, he will get his reward. But if any person's work is burned up, he will suffer the loss. Christian nationalism is going to be burned up. It will not stand the test. It's deception. We have to stick with the Word of God and only the Word of God, not the Word of God and what the news media tells us. That'll be burned up. That's confusion. It's a kingdom divided. And that is a wrong lens to look at America. The, young, the good young men that are coming of age and being sold, American patriotism are fighting for big oil and corporations. They're not fighting for freedom. That is the truth of the matter. And it's deception. They're being told, well, we're fighting for freedom in Afghanistan. And, you know, and they get them all their young testosterone and macho. And, ah, and yeah, and we, we're the patriots. It's a deception. You're fighting for rich people to get richer. That's what you're fighting for. It, it's sad but true. You can be mad at me, but it, it's the truth. That is what you're fighting for. You're being deceived into that. We are in the end times, and America is in judgment. And it's not going to get better. It's not going to be, get better until cities lie waste without inhabitant. And the Lord removes his people far away. That is what's coming to America. I mean, Ray said it the other night. I haven't heard it yet, but he told me that when God told Noah what was going to happen, it scared the willies out of Noah. It wasn't just reverential fear. It scared him. It motivated him to build an ark, a massive undertaking. It scared him so bad he built an ark. And not only that, I can't even round up our two donkeys. He rounded up all those animals and put them in there. I mean, what a massive undertaking. And then to get all the poop out of it all the time. I mean, I can't imagine. This is reality. You see what I'm saying? 
I mean, it is a massive undertaking. Why? Because it scared him. We should be scared at what's coming. Seriously. I mean, hey, yeah, we should believe God. But look, it says don't fear him that, that can kill the body. Fear him that can send your body and soul into hell. All right? All right, but if any person's work is burned up, he, suffers, he will suffer the loss, though he himself will be saved. See, he's talking to the body of Christ. He, in verse 1, he says, however, brethren. See, he's talking to the body of Christ here. He's not talking to the unsaved. He's talking to the saved. Right? But if you don't build what's right on the foundation, right? If you, if you in your mind, believe this deception and you're mixing it with the word, it's going to get burned up, right? He, and he will suffer the loss, though he himself will be saved. That's why you have a vast host in the wrath of God, but they're in heaven. They're saved, but they went through the fire, right? You see that? But only as one who has passed through the fire. All right, 1 Corinthians 2, right on the other page. We'll end with this. Uh, let's, let's start at verse 12. Now, we have not received the spirit that belongs to the world. You see that? The world has a spirit. It has a whole bunch of them, actually. Okay? We hadn't received that spirit, right? But the Holy Spirit, who's from God, given to us that we might realize and appreciate the gifts bestowed on, lavishly bestowed on us by God. And we are setting these truths forth in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual truths with spiritual language. Okay? But if you're mixing the spirit of the world and the world's language and the world's wisdom with God's, that's tainted. That's confusion. That's a divided kingdom and it can't stand. That's what, that's, that's what I'm saying to you. I mean, we got to be careful about the coming months ahead of us. Right? But the natural, non-spiritual man, see, you know, he read down there, I couldn't talk to you as spiritual, but it was unspiritual, right? The natural, non-spiritual man, oh, well, I'm spiritual because uh, I, I got saved when I was 10 years old, right? Yeah, no, 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 you got to go all the way through, all the way through. The non-spiritual man does not accept or welcome meant into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God. For they are folly, meaningless nonsense to them. You know, we've showed people, people that maybe y'all don't know, the revelation. They don't respond. They don't, they don't got nothing to say. It's like, what's, what's the matter with you people? I mean, wow. Right? Wow. It's, it's folly to them. He's incapable of knowing them because they are spiritually discerned and estimated and appreciated. But the spiritual man tries all things. He examines, investigates, inquires into, and questions and discerns all things. See, because the body of Christ is pushing this, this American patriotism, this Christian nationalism, I test it. I test it. Hey, is that real? Is that without deception? Is that really the truth? Is that flawless? No, it is not. And somebody has to say it. You know? Somebody's got to say it. So that other people can go, okay, I need to test this. And you do. You need to test it. 
Yet he is himself to be put on trial and judged by no one. He can read the meaning of ever, everything, but no one can properly get an insight into him. For who has known and understood the mind of the Lord so as to guide and instruct him and give him knowledge? But we have the mind of Christ, and we do hold the thoughts, feelings, and purposes of his heart. And see, this is the thing. We got to stay with the revelations that God gives us, the teaching that God gives us. If we mix it with these other things in the world, you're just, you're just mixing Babylon and Zion. That's what you're doing. You're mixing Babylon with Zion, and that's no good. We got to go Zion. That's it. You know, if, if you have one foot in the world and one foot in the church, you're in a heap of trouble. It doesn't get better for you. It'll just get worse and worse and worse until the day comes and you'll be saved, but only as one who passed through the fire. Okay? So, Father, help us to keep pure the Word of God. Help us, Father, to reject all falsity and be done with it and to receive your teaching and in your revelation that, that you, don't, you don't overwhelm us, Father, with things we couldn't understand, but you build on it so that we understand it better and better all the way through. So, Father, help us not to fall away and be deceived in this, but, but to receive what you have so, for us because you said we would know the truth if we abide in you if we abide and remain and be your disciples and that the truth would set us free. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name.